Hi, uh, I'm Paul Gilbert. Uh, I am a UX UI designer and developer here at 10 Pound Gorilla, and I'm going to start today talking uh, about Tailwind CSS animations. Um, when I first started here, um, I heard some whispers about Tailwind. I've known of Tailwind for a long time. I just never had any real reason to like start using it. Um, so this is my first foray into anything Tailwind. Um, Kind of different, kind of neat. Um, I don't know how I feel about it just yet. Um, with all the classes and then how you write everything, it's 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 interesting. All the stuff that you can do through classes, but I don't know how I don't know how reusable kind of things like that are. Like if you have to go change something, you have to go anyways. I'll skip that for now. Um, so I made it as with the last presentation, since it's animations, I wanted to do it in this little HTML framework I had. OK, so out of the box, uh, you get four animations from Tailwind. They're kind of generic and seem more like if you're doing like, I know that we have a large client that we're doing a very large UX UI thing with, and some of these things could be very useful on their site or their app, whatever you want to call it, their portal um, for loading. You have certain things like spin, ping for notifications, stuff like that. Pulse, obviously they're using some sort of like uh, content filler here while it's loading and then a bounce. So after those four, they have utility classes that you can also use as animations, but more like transitions if you want to do other things. Um, so for this basic utility slide I have, um, you can specify that there is going to be a there is a transition. You specify the easing, um, the delay. You can do that all here with classes, um, and then you can specify different hovers right here in the class. And so this one's using a translate, excuse me, and a hover. And so when you hover over it, it animates 125 percent, changes color, um, and translates. I guess a unit up. I don't actually know what the Y1 is. I guess I should have looked that up. Um, so you can do that with um, pretty much any object. I messed around with some other ones and you can you can just slap these things on here. Um, but after that, if you're getting into more complex um, animations, similar to what I did on the last presentation, like um, the offsetting stroke, you do the same stuff here. You have a keyframe and then you're saying what the animation is and what the changes are. You just do that differently. You put that in their config.js file as an extension. You don't have to, because you can also reference this. I'll say that in a little bit. You can reference that um, a different way as well. But if you want the animations in your theme, you put them in the config file, and then you also have to, after you add the keyframes of whatever, you have to add what the animation is. So they did one, I think they called it wiggle and did something, but I did this one, it's just shake. So as you hover over it, you can get it to do a number of things. You could get it to do spins and everything else if you really wanted to. Um, here it is, yeah. Tailwind uh, called those early ones helpful examples. So they're a way to like, they're jumping off point for you to understand how their animations work. And you can also just like in this example where the shake is up here in the keyframes, they have um, spin and bounce. So if you wanted to modify those, you could say instead of shake, you could say spin and you could modify. Sorry, that's wrong. This one down here, this animation, if you wanted to modify their out of the box animations for your theme, you could go through this. Uh, go th what trying to say, I don't even know. Um, but where it says shake, you would put spin or bounce, and then you can specify the time, the easing, all the other animation. Um, from that, you can also then do one off animations. So this is using the same one that I built up top, but I'm specifying it differently. So if you're doing that, you're using what they call arbitrary values. So there's a ton of them, but this one is saying animate and any arbitrary value has to go into brackets. And then you can specify what the animation is and all the other um, typical declarations for an um, transition or uh, animation. And you can reference it that way. Now, if you also 
had um, another CSS. It doesn't have to be in that JS file, the config file. You could have a normal CSS file that you're incorporating that has an animation already. So I can actually take some of mine from this um, framework and I could specify it here. Similarly, I just have to say what the animation is here instead of shake. And then I could I could fine tune it however I wanted for that specific application if it wasn't something that was going to be in the theme and something that was going to be reused everywhere. Um, but aside from that, um, everything else could for the most part for the most part could be handled similarly to how I did the last presentation. All the animations are built the same. It's just how you call them. Uh, the only difference is is there would be um, some of the way ways I'm adding classes in which to kick off animations. I don't know how that would really happen here. Um, haven't really figured that out. I tried getting it, but the only way I could see doing it is using just the normal classes that I use. But quick interruption when you're saying. Um like applying classes, you'd be applying a class to the SVG element when you wanted to start an animation. Yeah. Okay. So that's how I was doing it to some of my pres my other presentations. Um, but this, it, it would be the same way then. You're still just tying it to um, JavaScript or something else, adding a class to start it, start it off. Got it. But it is really neat that you can that you just put in a bunch of classes to do all this stuff. Um, now, certain ones on this, this um, animation I have here, so the animate shake, because it's using uh, the shake animation, the shake animation already has um, transform properties, so it doesn't let you take into account the other transform properties that were on this button earlier where it said translate Y or scale, so it doesn't scale or do anything like that because the animation's overriding it. I, I did have a quick question too. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, yeah, I know so, this, this is light on everything, but <laughs> there's a lot of classes that you put in to make the animations work. But if you were to build it, I mean, is there like one that's ultimately causing it to go that makes it? I'm trying to think of like when we build it to be conditional, when we want it to load. Yeah. You just apply right. one specific class in particular, if, or if you would want to do that, um, because yeah, I on the ten pound site, I'm using a class that just calls its animate item, and when animate item hits the viewport, then it's adding a class to it, and that class is where the animation sits. So that's what's kicking off all of our stuff. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't be able to use the classes necessarily the same way, just because how animates they um, if they're just being uh, called on load. Without, I mean, you can add a delay, but the delay doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to see it because it might not be in the viewport when the animation's starting. Yeah, so most of this is just on hover. So that's the other. Okay, so that's how this one works is on hover. So you can specify that too, which I don't have it in here. Ah, oh, dang, wrong dog. Um, so if I want to look at this, this is just specifying the animate on hover and that's how you call it there you can also turn uh, animations off on and off based on um breakpoint so i guess you might not want it on mobile perhaps that uses the same kind of tailwind format right it's like a md colon mm -hmm. yeah and hover then okay which yeah that's half my struggle was just getting the syntax right. i kept writing things wrong or missing a dash or missing something and it just nothing was working i'm curious and <laughs> thoughts on like and everybody's thoughts um how when using tailwind do you keep consistency um if multiple people are doing it so say i use i don't know some sort of padding a lot and i use that particular class a lot but then somebody else does a component or something and uses different classes and the spacing might be slightly different so how how with tailwind do you keep consistency as far as what classes are used and when they're used i mean that's kind of, to me that's the same as bootstrap i've worked with people that use bootstrap and they use different 
classes on that alone. I mean, yeah, same thing, especially on text. So, um, um, especially on WYSIWYGs, I try to keep most of those classes out of it. And so I make a dedicated text file that specifies um, the distance between two paragraphs, or if they add a button, the button after a paragraph adds so much margin up top so that they're just writing, you know, just basic, here's an anchor tag, here's a button, whatever, and they don't have to worry about putting classes in. But yeah, as far as development goes, it would be one of those things, almost like naming, you'd have to be on the same page with this is how all the padding works for everything, so. Yeah, and it's kind of similar like to the bootstrap spacing utilities that ultimately gets configured when you do your initial theme build. So you already have like what is your MB one, two, three, four, five. And so when you start to code your components, you already have that built out. And typically we'll have like one developer go through, build the theme. And then at that point we might bring in other developers to do like too sexy or easy DNN or other module development. But at that point, again, the theme has already been defined, the styles, the rules have been set up. So it should still be consistent if you're using Tailwind or Bootstrap. But I don't know, maybe break those rules at different points in time. Yeah, I, yeah, I, mean, I guess it, it's true within Bootstrap too, because like maybe there was a way that some the original developer coded the theme for in Bootstrap, but then I go in and I take some markup and I go, well, I know Bootstrap has the class padding top dash five, and I'm going to use that, even so, even because I didn't know that the theme was using these classes for their standard padding or something like that. So that's sort of like the thing that I'm thinking about is, mm. and that probably still happens with how we do stuff today because. I know I'm guilty of it all the time. I do stuff in, in the markup and I don't want to create some new CSS class or whatever, and I just want some padding or something, then I'll use those more utility type classes a lot. Um, yeah. But then if there was an update that was made site-wide, you know, maybe some markup then doesn't get applied and the changes because that particular class wasn't um, um, in, uh, thought of or whatever um, taken into consideration. But so I guess that'd be true in, in both situations. Yeah, and I'm thinking also like when you go to update components over time, like you might break your own rules that you have or the style guide rules of like normally this component has 45 pixels of margin, but for some reason a developer changed that and decided to use 30 pixels. Now it's inconsistent, but that's probably across the board of any CSS style framework that you're using. Yeah, and it gets hard. I was just thinking about, you know, working on, um, I'm working on a project right now and it's using DNN Go, but DNN Go has hijacked a bunch of the utilities from Bootstrap. So um, say margin five on normal Bootstrap is something like two, two and some change. I, I think it's, I don't know what the, the actual, uh, uh, DNN Go has hijacked it, so PY5 is just five pixels top and bottom, and four is four pixels top and bottom. Such a huge difference. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, so how usable are those? And so how they're doing it is actually just making um, columns and boxes, and the boxes have a height of, arbitrarily, they have, I think, 60, 50, 20 and 10 like i thought they were doing it at, by tens at first but then they're skipping around too so it's kind of hard and then they're changing how things align based on um the display block or display um none so i guess um yeah it's all de it's all dependent on whoever's starting it and who's changing what so it's really hard you have a framework that should has documentation but then people do stuff that make it so it's not super usable. I think the I think way the, that the Tailwind um, documentation wants you to, to use it is, it wants you to as much as possible, if something's going to be reused to 
reuse it with a markup template. Um, because obviously, yeah, having to reuse a specific set of classes in a million different places, if it's actually notated in those million different places would be a problem. But like, for example, the too sexy boilerplate has a like a button helper that has the markup for a button in it. I think that's kind of what they're going for. Basically, when there's something that's going to be put in a bunch of different places, the markup for it, and therefore the styles in this case are kind of in one place. Yep. So, like by setting up a two sixty partial, you don't have to manage your button code in every template file where you use a button because it's only going to be referenced from one source code, if you will. Um, same thing. Yeah. Like if you're building cards and maybe you have different variations of them, like the wrapper of it is still consistent. So it's not being reused all over the place and becoming inconsistent over time. But that might be harder to manage. So, but I think things like a button or image properties that you're putting in there, different classes for images and whatnot, like those can be easily compartmentalized, standardized, and tucked away, I guess. Or even if we were building these with partials, I could see doing that with um tailwind that way all the classes were in one spot mm -hmm. but it was neat i mean it was it was fun like i've kind of not been afraid of of getting into tailwind but i was just like under the impression i guess i was already in, under the impression i would not like it i don't i don't love it but i don't hate it <laughs> so i think it could be useful in some you know if you're trying to really maybe prototype fast the way they do colors and hovers and everything, you might be able to do some pretty neat stuff pretty quickly. But you... yeah, I think Aaron Lopez did a, a session at one point. It was kind of going through, and that was one of his big draws for Tailwind is that it was very easy to just like code on the fly and start to get something put together really quickly. Um, but yeah, the all of the like pseudo classes for doing animations and breakpoints just terrifies me. <laughs> yeah. I I'm uh, at one point one of my buttons was like 20 some classes and I'm just like this is why I'd, I would be scared of doing this. It's just so many classes, but yeah. Um, it it'd be cool to look at. I think I don't remember if it was Dustin or, or Gabe you mentioned the I think it was the prettier compile tool then goes through and breaks up your classes into a consistent format. So you have like all of your display, then your typography or something along those lines. So it breaks them up and keeps them organized. Like it makes those classes easier to read. That would probably help me a lot in like swaying me towards Tailwind if I can have a logical way to read all of those classes and understand like what is doing what. That would probably go a long way. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our Gorilla Learning Lab. We have a lot more banana tidbits for you to get ape over. Check out our other videos or visit our website at www.10poundgorilla.com. I'm swinging on out of here. Ooh, ooh, ah, ah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You're not subscribed? That's bananas!